In this example, we're going to look at a slightly more complicated mechanism. We've got two steps, it's sequential, and we're going to use a numerical approach. And we'll also play around with the connects parameters to see how if we change K, the relative values of K1 and K2, it changes the concentration profile. So first, whenever you do one of these problems in MATLAB or Python or whatever, start by doing a little bit of work beforehand on paper. You will really pay off. So let's suppose you're given this mechanism and you were told to come up with some sort of script to output the concentrations of all three species A, B, and C as a function of time. Start by writing the mechanism. Keep that front and center the whole time you're working. Okay, so you've got a reactant A, which in a step with rate constant B goes on to form, uh, K1 goes to form B, and the second step goes to form C. So we've got two irreversible steps where B is the intermediate. So keep that mechanism in front. Second thing you should do is say, okay, for each rate constant, that is a step, a mechanistic step. I'm gonna write the expression for the rate of that step. So if it's a mechanism, we can pull out the order from the molecularity, right? So this is, these are both unimolecular steps, and so we know they're both gonna be first order in the reactant. So for step one, the speed of that step is just K1 times the concentration of A. And for step two, the speed of that step is the concentration of B times K2, because that's also unimolecular. So that's the rate of the step. Separately from that, you want to write expressions for the concentration derivatives. So how the concentrations of A, B, and C vary with time. And for some of those, there'll be a simple relationship between the step rate and the concentration derivative. Um, but in some cases, you'll have, like in the case of B, one step feeds into B and one step drains B. And so you're gonna have more than one step in your expression for the concentration derivative. So the simple ones first, A. We can see that A is being drained away by step one. And so the concentration derivative of A is just the negative of V1, okay? And for C, it's even more simple because C is being built up by step two, so the speed of step two is the same as the concentration derivative for C. B is the most complex in this one because we can see that we have one step that feeds into B, step one, and step two drains B. So it's V1 minus V2 is our concentration derivative of B. And you can see also that as you go to more and more complex mechanisms where maybe some of the reactions are reversible, like we have a, a K1 prime step that's reversible or a K2 prime step that is reversible, then we're gonna have more and more um, terms relating the step speed into the concentration derivatives. Okay, and if we wanted to, we could substitute our expressions for the step into the concentration derivatives. And I recommend we do that. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so we've substituted in our expressions for V1 and V2. And so now we have three differential equations, right? We have that the rate of change of A is minus K1A. The rate of change of C is K2 times B. And the rate of change of B is K1A, where A is feeding into uh, forming B, minus K2B, right? Because we're draining out in that step. So we write our differential equations first. Now, if we did this by hand, we would have to somehow solve this system of three different differential equations. And in, um, we don't have to because we're gonna do a numerical approach. So now that we've got these concentration derivatives, we're ready to write code. So do this first, don't start writing code right away because it's too easy to get confused. Also, I recommend breaking it into first doing step rates and then concentration derivatives. Don't skip steps, skipping steps is a way to make errors. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with this to close everything up. So we're gonna close all and clear all. And, and clear up all our output. And uh, you wanna start with a block where you say what your various uh, rate constants for your steps are, forward or backward if, the, if you have any. And you also wanna say how long you wanna integrate for. So uh, you could have, uh, uh, you might use units of seconds or units of minutes, it's, it's totally up to you, but you, you probably, uh, in a real problem, you wanna actually say what the, what the units are in, in the comments after this. So you might want to, um, for instance, say like, maybe I'm going to, uh, 
do time in seconds or something. Of course, that's going to change the, uh, depending on what time units you are, that's going to change what units you're using for your rate constants. So if we look at the mechanism we had, these were all um, unimolecular reactions. And so we could say that we were, um, yeah, we had, oops, that we had um, our rate constants are going to have units of uh, one over one over seconds because we're we're working we're working with if they're unimolecular reactions they're going to be first order so they have to have units of reciprocal time so we might as well use one over seconds okay so um, you have to decide for every component and probably a good idea is if you have uh, different components you could uh, put them in order. So we'll probably put some, let's put some comments in here as well, saying that uh, um, we've got A and B and C. So those are the concentrations of our, um, our initial reactant, that's our intermediate, and that's our product. To start, we're just starting off with reactant. Okay, so we're just laying down initial conditions and what the rate constants are. Okay. And what we're going to do is rather than have these be separate variables for the concentrations of uh, each of these things, we're just going to put them into a vector and have, and have uh, each concentration be an element of the vector, right? So we're going to have, we're going to have a, a column vector and the first element is concentration of A, second is B, C. And so it's probably, even though the computer is not going to see this because this is all just comments, it's good to put this in there so you don't get lost in your own code. Okay, um, so we now are going to define a function, and if we look at our function, you can see that it's got uh, arguments: the temperature, or sorry, temperature of the time, and uh, we're going to have that be in seconds. And then x is concentration, right? So basically, we've got concentration and time in here. And if you look at this you've got K1, that first rate constant, times X1. So what's that gonna be? So as a reminder, we said that our three differential equations for the three different chemicals were minus K1A, K1A minus K K2B, and K2B. So if we go back to our code, we see we've got minus K1, X1, and X1 is A. K1 times X1, minus K2 times X2, so that's K1A minus K2B. And finally, we've got K2 X2 or K2 times B. So these equations here, these this is the three differential equations that we wrote down at the start of our analysis. So this is the heart of our, of our expression. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that all these tick marks just turn what would be a row vector into a column vector and column vectors are just a little nicer, so I like to have column vectors. We're eating away at A, we're both eating away at B and making B, and then we're just producing C, okay? So if we look at this, this is a function that is telling us how rapidly the concentrations are changing. And so what it's gonna do is gonna take the initial concentrations and change A by this amount, and change B by this amount, and change C by this amount, and take one time, time steps forward. And it's gonna recalculate this function and then add that change. And we're gonna slowly change the concentrations uh, step by step as we go through this reaction, just like you did when you did this by hand in class. Okay, uh, this is telling it, this is just an ordinary differential equation um, solver that's gonna come up with a, uh, basically a smooth curve uh, doing this. And so what we have here, um, we're telling it, we've got the variables t, we've got, um, it's telling us to calculate co a concentration profile at each time. And it's gonna do that by using this function sequential, right? Sequential is a derivative. It's going to basically um, add those derivatives to the concentration profile to make the smooth curve. So it's throwing in our changes in concentration um, time span, remember, time span is telling us basically how far we have to go for how many seconds. And this is telling us our initial concentrations. So those are the arguments we need for our uh, differential equation solver. All right, so we've got a differential equation. 
we put it into the uh, differential equation solver and now we're going to um, you'll notice that what it's doing here is it's producing calculated values of x now remember x for every time point is going to be three different numbers it's going to be the concentration of a b and c so this is actually a matrix where um, for a bunch of different time points we have values for each of these okay all right so now we're going to do plots but since we've got three concentrations we're going to do three plots so in the plot statement we have our original time range that's going to be our x coordinate and our y coordinate is going to be for our first plot it's going to be remember we have a matrix with our values of computed concentrations and so, so this is saying where this is row column notation this is every row of that matrix but I only want the first column right so the first column is going to be my concentration of A okay so concentration of A as a function of time and this statement here K is just a MATLAB code for the color black so I'm going to plot everything in black. And so if you know you're going to, if you're not going to use a color printer, uh, I would just tell it on the onset to make everything black because it's going to look funny when you do different colors. Sometimes some like yellow is going to be too light to see. So um, and when you when you publish papers, uh, color figures are more expensive. So a lot of times we use black and white. So um, I like to use black and then differentiate by the symbol. So the circle just means plotted as a circle. So all my data points are circles. And that hold on means don't erase the first plot when you make the second plot. So it's just going to say, okay, don't erase anything. So it leaves the first plot and on top of it, it puts the second plot. So the second plot, I'm doing all the rows and this time the second column of that matrix with calculated concentration values. And this time I'm still going to do black, that's the K, and the S just means square. So instead of having uh, circles, my data points are squares. And I'm going to do a third plot. This may concentration is C, right? So it's the third column in my calculated concentration um, matrix. And this time there's going to be diamond shapes. Okay, so you can just Google uh, data point shapes or plot shapes uh, in or symbol, plot symbols in MATLAB, and you can see all the different because there's there's a ton of different symbols you can use. Okay, so um, you may have noticed. Uh, when I first wrote this, I, had, I wrote this as a loop because whenever you have, like I have three things that are essentially identical, it's faster just to write it as a loop. Uh, but I realized that many of you have not gotten to loops yet in your, in your sort of MATLAB learning. So uh, if you've only got a few things, two or three things, there's nothing wrong with just writing three statements. You can just copy and paste and then just change the stuff that's different. But here I just, um, I did a for loop because that was that's faster to write. So later on when you've, um, done more MATLAB, you're going to want to write loops because it will speed things up for you. But for now, just ignore that. Oh, um, this just says show graph. So this like uh, when, when, it, when you run the script, it's going to pop the graph window to the to the front so you can see it. OK, so let's go ahead and run this. Um, let's see, we have two. We have K1 and K2 be the same. So we've got rate constants that are the same size for our first and second steps. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll say um, run section and I get this plot. So if we look at this, we have, um, remember that we, our code was circles was reactant A. And I could put a legend on here, but you can see this is the reactant, it's decreasing. And squares were the intermediate, so it increases, but then it decreases as a second reaction eats it away. And, and then our, our product just goes up and asymptotes out. And eventually, because these reactions are irreversible, all of our reactants can end up as products. So we're going to asymptote out at the same concentration as our original concentration of reactant. Notice that if the rate constants for consecutive reactions are comparable, the steady state assumption is totally wrong, right? This is not approximately zero. It's also not approximately constant. So don't don't default to saying, oh, consecutive reactions, I can use the steady state approximation because it's often totally wrong. So when it is it? appropriate. Well, let's do some experiments. Let's see what happens if we make the second step um, uh, slower than the first step. So we'll say we'll leave this a point, we'll make this 0.05 and we'll make this second step 0.2. And we'll run this and see if this is a reasonable amount of time to run this. Okay, so we have a, a, a step with a fast rate constant and then a step with a slow rate constant. And we can see, oh, no, the intermediate really builds up, 
Of course, if you have a, a, a fast step followed by a slow step, you're gonna end up with the buildup of the intermediate. So clearly, steady state assumption doesn't work there either. On the other hand, if I made a step with a small rate constant followed by one with a large rate constant, and then run this, now we can see, oh, the intermediate doesn't build up as much. Now this is only a factor of four difference between my rate constant. So if I made this uh, a 0.01 followed by a, oh, let's, 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 make it, let's make it ridiculous by making it a 10. So here we're really waiting for that first step. So that remember if you have a, if you have a step with a small rate constant that's earlier, it is gonna be rate limiting. So we should see our intermediate not really build up this time. So, because this is a hundred fold difference. Um, oh, it's a thousand fold difference. Okay, yeah, it shouldn't build up at all. So we're in the section and we can see our intermediate doesn't build up at all. Um, actually, this reaction's a little bit too, um, too slow. See, so the symbols are on top of each other. So let's, let's make this 0.1. Now it's only a hundred fold difference. Okay, so with a hundred fold difference, we can see our circles are dying off and here's our diamonds, which is our product, but our intermediate is just like, it is approximately constant. So if you have a hundred fold difference in the size of the rate constant between step one and step two and the smaller rate constants first, then yeah, the steady state assumption does work. Okay, so that's just messing around with the parameters. So the cool thing is when you write a script like this, you can just play around with the different sizes, the rate constants, and see when these sort of limiting assumptions work and when they don't work. All right, so that's all for that. Um, uh, good luck coding, and I will see you in class.